Nothing hardens a samurai's sword more than the thought of owning land, and nothing softens a peasant's pickaxe more than the thought of having their land owned by samurai. In the Kamakura period of Japan, the warrior class started taking over land all across Japan and became the worst landlords ever. How did they do this, and what abuses did they inflict upon the peasants? This time on History with Chibis. In the Nara period, all lands were owned by the state, the imperial court. They were public lands. Tax money went directly to the state to fund important work in the capital, like parties mainly, mostly parties. In the Heian period, things began to change. The court started carving up some of the public lands to make private lands, called shōen. The shōen system was important, so repeat the word three times in the comments, it'll be on the test. The court gave out shōen as awards to members of the imperial family, other nobles, temples, and shrines. These lands were free from the hand of the state. The government couldn't even chase criminals that ran into a shōen. A shōen paid no taxes to the state. Nice, so peasants got to keep all their money, right? Nope. Peasants paid taxes to the shōen owner, so owning these lands was pretty sweet. Most shōen owners didn't even live on their land. They were aristocrats who lived in and around the capital. They usually had a local representative to manage things. It was like owning an apartment building and hiring a property manager to manage it while you sip on wine in a Lambo in your pool. Over time, the number of shōen exploded. The country was a crunchberry cereal bowl of public and private land, and life was pretty good for landowners. Until the warriors rose up. A hurricane called the Genpei War blew across Japan. Out of the blood arose a military government in Kamakura, ruled by a shogun. It was awkward because the traditional civilian government in Kyoto was still there, like, oh hi. Japan was ruled by two governments. The new Kamakura government sent men from its warrior houses to shōen across Japan to manage the lands as reward for their service. These men were called jitō. And so it became. A shōen was not only controlled by one shōen owner from Kyoto, but also one jitō from Kamakura. Problem was, the jitō only answered to Kamakura, not the landowner. If the landowner had a problem with the jitō, all he could do was angrily file a lawsuit with Kamakura and violently sit there awaiting the shogunate's judgment. With the jitō managing private lands, it was a case of having too many cooks in the chicken. Between the jitō and the landowner, it wasn't clear who controlled what. When the shogunate leaders sent their men all over the country, they gave them very clear instructions. Go manage the land, just make sure to follow local customs, whatever that meant. It was up to the jitō to learn the local customs, so they could ignore them. A jitō would travel across the country to his assigned shōen and stroll in with his thick sword swinging about like he owned the place. He was an outsider, he didn't know any of the local agreements between the peasants who lived there and the previous land manager, nor did he care much. Remember, these jitō were men of the sword, men of the bow and arrow, men of the wrapping and the pillaging. Before the war that formed the shogunate, many of them were bandits going around stealing food and women. It was a constant battle between the jitō and the landowner over who controlled what. The jitō basically did whatever he could get away with. Japanese trees today tell their children of the great massacre of their ancestors, who were used to create mountains of complaint letters that were sent to the shogunate. Here's a record of what one warrior did, but his actions were pretty common among jitō. He collected money from peasants for himself and his men, even forced them to send him regular deliveries of cloth and other goods. He forced people to do random projects for him during harvest time, when they were supposed to be busy harvesting. He used other people's horses for his family to get around, and when his family wanted to travel far away, he forced the community to donate men and transportation. It was typical for samurai to force peasants to work in their homes as servants, cooks, or whatever. They even demanded free labor for random projects. Hey George, why don't you add a pool to my house? It's for official business. When they did this during harvesting or planting season, it threatened the livelihoods of farmers. 
Wanjito ordered some peasants to come with him to the capital to do some labor, then locked them in a hut at night to keep them from running. A local shrine was like, hey, could you please let them go? These are virtuous people who are protected by the gods. The Chito replied, they are worthless peasants, not people of the gods. This seemed to be a common opinion among Chito. Another Jito kept forcing his way into the homes of commoners to stay the night because he didn't want to travel in unlucky directions. Yep, that was a thing people believed in. Peasants didn't feel pleasant. Most Shoen owners lived far away in the capital. Most Jito did live in their Shoen, but they moved in from elsewhere. The locals must have felt like they were being controlled by outsiders. Power-hungry samurai pissed off everyone, even the higher-ups in the military capital. The mountains of complaints and devastated forests were hard to miss, but the shogunate leaders were in a tough spot. They didn't want to dish out harsh punishments to their most valuable men. Jito were important followers. Plus, men of war are like Q-tips. You shouldn't push them too hard. However, shogunate leaders did often rule against Jito, stopping their most blatant abuses. They were like, all right, Babu Naga, pump the brakes on that using people as slaves business. They tried their best to get Jito and Shoen owners to work together to control the peasants. Now, you really didn't want warriors accumulating too much land. The plural of land is rebellion. Jito tried to grab land whenever they could. When Ijito was first assigned to a shōen, he was given a small plot of land in the shōen where he could live, grow food, and mistreat the locals. He collected money from this land and wasn't taxed on it. Back in those days, commoners often left their homes and fields, either because they didn't like the people there or wanted different opportunities in other regions. They left behind empty lands, and the Jito would be like, well, it's my land now. Problem was, if this kept happening, over time the Jito would take over more and more areas. Shoen owners complained, and Kamakura finally ruled that vacated lands had to be split equally between Shoen owner and Jito. The shogunate also said that after a peasant family paid their annual tax, they were free to stay in the Shoen or bounce. This made it hard for a Jito to bind peasants to the land, preventing them from growing too strong and independent. Peasants did try to protest and fight back, especially in the West where the shogunate's influence wasn't as strong, but it didn't seem to make a difference. Pharmacies made a killing on aspirin in those days, with all the shoen owners suffering headaches from dealing with these warriors. Some shoen owners said screw it and entered into tax collection contracts with their jito. The contracts basically said fine, you can control everything, just pay me an annual tax. Not only was controlling the whole shoen pretty neat, these contracts made the jito rich. They could be really one-sided. One jito collected 50 times more tax money than the money he sent to the shoen owner. Sometimes a shoen owner would even split the ownership of the land with the jito. Okay, do whatever you want on your side, but stay out of mine. When this happened, the jito went from owning a small plot of land to owning a huge chunk of the shoen. This was a bigger deal than the tax collection contracts from before, because the jito became a major landowner instead of just a land manager. The shogunate tried to limit the growing power of its warriors, but the jito started to overtake the shoen system. The shoen system of rule by a faraway owner didn't break down in the Kamakura period, but it was the beginning of the end. The shift of land ownership from faraway nobles to local warlords was a big deal, and it allowed samurai to amass local power and wage the wars in later periods that we all know and love. For more Japanese history videos, check these out. Okay, we have a new emperor on Patreon today, Rachel McKenzie. Thanks so much, you're awesome. We also have regular patrons, Tamaki the dog, Arf, arf. Allison Fincher, Char C, and Darren Pierce. All right, I love you and spread the knowledge. Oh, Merry Christmas, you bastards.